Archer and I were laughing the other day because of a story I told at another congregation. There was a time when my mother, the majority of our childhood, my mother uh, was a mom at home uh, with, at that particular time, uh, five children. And she uh, had her hands full with the five of us, especially me and my brother, uh, because so many times we acted like we had lost our mind and she would have to work on us and work with us quite often. Uh, I told you about that holy device that she had, that, that switch that turned corners, and she most certainly used it whenever she had to deploy uh, it uh, to our benefit, of course, in love. Uh, I remember on one occasion when my mother was going to go to work. She needed a new washing machine. She wanted one of those newfangled machines that didn't have a ringer on it and didn't use a number two and number three tub. <laughs> and my, my daddy, of course, the deal was, well, we can't afford that right now. So she said, well, I, I'll buy it. Mama uh, was a very smart woman. She got a job. I believe it was at a place at that particular time called Shangberg's in Memphis. And she got a, a job there, I guess, uh, putting out clothes or whatever women did in that store when the store was closed. So she went to work one day and left us at home. And she gave us specific instructions. Uh, the, the tea, my dad's tea, was in a, a container, very recognizable. Everybody knew it. That's daddy's tea that he drinks at dinner. Uh, and, and we don't bother my daddy's tea. Of course, we, we had a big thing of red Kool-Aid, and we all had our, our jelly jars that we had at, at lunch. Mine was um, uh, Quick Draw McGraw, and uh, uh, we, all, we all had that, and so we all understood that we could have that. We were not to eat the lunch meat, as she called it. That was the chopped ham that she would buy and have wrapped in the white paper that she would make our sandwiches for school that following week, and we were not to touch that. Several other things we weren't to touch. We were not to go in the front yard. We were not to jump on the beds, and I think all of you know the drill. Well, when Mama left, we lost our mind. Uh, I don't know what happened to us that day. I don't know why it happened, but I believe some evil spirit came in the house and took over our bodies. We did everything mama told us not to do, ate everything mama told us not to eat, drank up daddy's tea. I think somebody <laughs> broke a lamp. I'm not sure uh, if, if we, uh, at that particular time, all of us probably should have been committed. Fact of the matter is, after having all this fun, eating up all this food, drinking up all this tea, it hit us. Mama's coming back. And you're talking about a bunch of scared children running around trying to clean up and fix up. You can't put the tea back in the bottle. You can't uneat the lunch meat. So we knew we were in for it because Mama was coming back. And Mama came back, and we had a come to Jesus meeting on that day uh, that I remember even 50 years later. The fact of the matter is, if we had kept in our mind throughout that day that mama's coming back, we probably would have made better decisions. We probably would have left daddy's tea alone, that lunch meat alone, stayed out of her bedroom, and all the things she told us not to do if we had just stayed focused on the fact mama's coming back, it would have made us much better children on that day. But we lost sight of the fact that Mama would eventually. She was gone. Mama's gone. Let's have fun. But Mama was coming back. How many of us have forgotten that Jesus is coming back? As the beautiful song our brother just chose a moment ago. How many of us have forgotten that one day the Lord has already said, I'm coming like a thief in the night. Now, I have never met a thief who screams out, I'm getting ready to come in your house and rob it. I just wanted you to know before I came in. The Lord said, I'm coming like a thief in the night. I'm coming stealth. I'm coming, I'm coming by surprise. You're not going to expect me. There will be no signs to tell you that in a moment the judgment day will be. The Lord said, I'm coming back. 
And he told every one of us and gave us some specific instructions as to what we were supposed to do while he was gone. He told us to preach the gospel. He told us to stand for what is right, to be pure, to be a light, to be the salt of the earth. He gave us specific instructions as to those things that we are supposed to do and that we're supposed to be while he is gone to get the house ready for each and every one of you. Let not your heart be troubled, the Lord said. Don't get caught up in the anxiety of the day, the troubles of the day, the worries of the day. Let not your heart, you be different from everybody else. You have a peace, and let that peace be manifested to all men that pass it understanding. And the Lord told us this, that he was coming back again. Like a thief in the night, Peter said, all these things shall be dissolved. They shall be dissolved. And if you look at that word dissolved in that context, and Josh will tell you from that context in the Greek, what the Lord has said, it is dissolving. It's not that all of a sudden it's going to dissolve. God says it's dissolving as we speak. Every earthquake, every hurricane, every volcano that erupts, every time the earth shakes or, or, or shimmers or does something that we don't expect, it's because God put a time clock on this thing a long time ago. And he turned that clock on and it's been ticking now for over 5,000 years. And the Lord said, it is dissolving even as we speak, we go all around this earth and we look at the various faults, the San Andreas fault, the New Madrid fault. All of these faults are extremely active and there is water. You may have been too late for the water, but as my daddy used to say in one of his sermons, you'll be just in time for the fire. And God's going to come back again. The Lord's coming back again. And the Lord said, I'm going to get my folks out First, I'm going to get my people out. They're going to meet me in the air. Meet me on the cloud. I tell folk all the time, they're going to have to tell me to shut up because I'm going to be acting a fool on that cloud. I'm going to be so glad to go to heaven and be with my Lord. Every one of us never lose focus, never lose sight of the fact that the Lord's coming back. And he's coming back for one reason. He doesn't have any more redemptive work to do on this earth. He completed his redemptive work. When Jesus rose from the grave and said, All authority, all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Jesus had completed his redemptive work. When he hung there on that cross between the twilights of two worlds, a thief on either side. And the Lord uttered those victorious words, It is finished. I have dotted every I, crossed every T, fulfilled all the righteousness, everything the prophet said that I'm supposed to complete. I have done it. It is finished. Lord's not coming back to hold a meeting. He's not coming back to do evangelistic work. He's not coming back to try to change any hearts, to heal any of those who are sick, to save the lives of any more women caught in sin, to open the eyes of the blind. He's coming for one reason, to get his children out of this mess and take them home. And that's the reason why he's coming. And the rest will be taken care of by God's will for those who won't be going with him. And it's not going to be a nice day. He's coming back. Just like mama came back, the Lord's coming back. And we as his children should never lose sight of the fact that he's coming in glory one of these days. Let's go home with him in glory. When he comes back to get us, let's go home with him. Pray with me. Merciful God, as we stand before your people, the greatest people on earth, we pray on this night that the things that we say and do will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Do you want to go to heaven? I believe you do. I believe that you're here tonight for one reason, because you want to be saved. And there are a lot of folks who claim they want to be saved, but they don't live like they want to be saved. I call them practical atheists. It's not that they don't believe that there is a God. They just live like there is no God. Their life says 
there is no God. When the wise man said, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He didn't say the fool stood up and made a declaration, there is no God. There is no God. He didn't say it out of his mouth. He said he has said in his heart, there is no God. His heart, his understanding, his belief, as the Lord, as Paul said, your conscience seared with a hot iron, in essence, in his heart, his soul, his mind, his thinking, in his reasoning, has not made living for God a priority within his life. The sinful and stubborn nature of man will often rebel against God, rebel against his law. It is conceivable when we look around us, and I read this wonderful book, it is conceivable that we could still be in paradise. God had given us a body that wouldn't wear out. Did you know that we already had eternal life? That there was no such thing as death and sickness and sorrow and sadness and anxiety. There was no pain. There were no ailments, no pandemics, no coronavirus. None of that stuff existed. We were in paradise, and it's conceivable that all man had to do to have everlasting life was to do what God told him to do. God gave man everything, formed him from the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, gave him a woman, brought everything in front of him and showed it all to him, and then made him a woman and brought her, God the father of the bride, brought the bride to Adam. And Adam, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, was in paradise. Their name was Adam. All they had to do, God said, of every tree, of every tree, I give you dominion, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. You have dominion. It belongs to you. He said, of every tree you may freely eat, freely eat. I'm going to give you work because I believe in a work ethic. You dress it and keep it. You got a job. You dress it and keep it. But of all that you see, you may consume because I made it for you. God didn't need the earth. God's in heaven. God's omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnificent. God knows everything, has all power, and is everywhere. God made this earth, formed it, weighed it in his hand, tilted it over, spin it around just a little bit, set a sun up there to keep it warm, set a moon up there to keep it balanced, put the stars in the canopy to make it all beautiful, and then gave it to man and said, this is yours. I bequeath this to you. All you got to do is keep it. But, you know, as I said, I will quote every night, you got an opponent. You got somebody that's so crazy, so silly, so foolish, so disobedient. How do you get kicked out of heaven? I mean, just think about that. How do you get kicked out of heaven? And somebody who got thrown out of heaven because of arrogance and sin, as Paul talked about it, pride, which is that sin that he said, why? He said, you don't put a novice where they're not supposed to be. Because that condemnation of the devil is not the devil condemning you. It's what condemned the devil. Pride condemned him and God put him out. So you've got someone walking around filled with hatred and envy and malice and looking at man and came and told the first and most diabolical lie that has ever been told. God said, you eat of this tree, you're going to die. It's just that simple. You eat of this tree. I'm going to give you everything. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put the tree in the midst of the garden so you can't say, well, God, I didn't know which tree you were talking about. I'm going to put it right in the middle so you can't miss it. And he said, if you eat of that tree, you shall die. That came directly from the mouth of God. And if God can make you alive, God can make you dead. Satan came around and said, you, aren't, you, you won't die. Don't believe God. You know God's not telling you the truth. Aren't you the big dog around here? Aren't you the big shot around here? Aren't you in charge of this thing? Well, yeah, yeah, but God told me not even to touch his tree. God didn't say nothing about not touching it. God said, don't eat it. 
The devil will always make us exaggerate God's law. He'll always make what God tells us seem so bad. So hard, so much drudge. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I see. When God has told me to do certain things, it just seems so hard to do. The devil understands our nature. And this is why the Apostle Paul, as I told you last evening, said in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Protect your head, your heart. Protect your vitals. Protect your stand. Get your feet girded. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the lies, the juggling of the devil. Why? Because he hates you. And that's why Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Because you have an opponent, an adversary. Let me tell you what his name is. The devil, who as a roaring lion walked about seeking whom he may devour. In essence, Peter said, brothers and sisters, I'm trying to get y'all to heaven. I'm trying to get you up on that cloud. I'm trying to have you ready when the Lord comes. And I cannot forsake to tell you that somebody's tracking you the way a hunter tracks a coon or a rabbit or a dove or the geese or whatever his prey may be. You've got someone tracking you and trying to make you fail and falter. You know, Peter stood before the Lord, didn't he? Lord said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no, Lord, uh -uh, not me, not your rock. No, Lord, not me. Lord said, you're going to deny me, Peter. No, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. I know you, God, and you know everything, but you don't know this. Because I will, he says, I'll die for you. You see, the Lord knows every one of us, no matter what we think of ourselves. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Peter said, no, Lord, no way in the world I'm going to do that. But the fact of the matter is, Peter was trusting in the power of Peter, not in the power of God. And Peter's power failed and faltered. And three times, Peter said, I don't even know the man. And on the third time, put emphasis on it by cursing and swearing. That's why God said, I'm trying to save my people, the church. If we're going to save America... America has to have a righteous church filled with righteous people who do righteous things so that men and women of this nation can see the difference between the holy and the profane. But we can't fool ourselves because you got to trust, as Paul said, the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. How do you do that? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not my own intuitiveness, intelligence, and reason. I've got to step back from what I think I know and start stepping up to what the Lord tells me I need to know from his word. This is the reason why the Hebrew writer, when the Hebrew brethren were ready to quit, throw up their hands and go into apostasy. They're all saying, nobody told us it was going to be like this. Nobody told us they were going to be putting us on poles, covering us with pitch and tar and other flame mitts, olive oil, and lighting us on fire to light the streets of Rome. Nobody told us they were going to be leading us into the circus, the Colosseum, and allowing a ravenous beast to disembowel us. Nobody told us that they were going to be beheading us and chopping us up and taking our stuff and running us in the street and abusing our women and our daughters. Nobody told us. The, uh, the Hebrew, the Hellenistic Jews were ready to go into apostasy. The Hebrew writer didn't apologize and say, well, you know what? You write, church. You write, church. I know it's hard out there. It's hard out there in, in Nero and Dominican and others. They are terrible rulers and leaders. So, y'all, I tell you what, God's going to give you a pass. And he's going to let y'all just, 
just get by because he knows how hard it is. No. Hebrew chapter 5 and verses 12, the Hebrew writer said, When time when you ought to be teachers. You ought to be the masters. You ought to be stronger, more fervent, more steadfast, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 58. As every one of you can quote, Paul said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why, Paul? Because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord knows what you're going through. The Lord knows when they talk about the church and they talk about the scripture and they talk about our Savior and they belittle us because of our beliefs in those things that are written. The Lord knows what they're saying, but he also knows what he expects out of us. For us to be a righteous church and we can't be cowards and righteous at the same time. We've got to have the guts, the fortitude, and the courage to stand up and look the devil in his eye and say, I shall not be moved. The apostle Paul, when he looked at them and looked at all that he was going through, Paul said, I'm set. I am set for the defense of the gospel. In essence, Paul says, I'm not moving. My daddy used to say, I'm not moving another father. It stops right here. And I remember him saying that in a sermon one time, and it impressed me that what he's saying is that we as Christians, we don't compromise, capitulate, and give in to those things that are wrong. If the world has made a decision that it's going to disobey God, the church don't go along with it. If the politicians and the government has made a decision that it's going to violate God's law. That one shiny place sitting on a hill is the church. The Lord's people. They will shine light in darkness. And the Lord commands you. Anytime we need to realize this, we can go back to what the Hebrew writer said. Having rebuked them, what he said to them in Hebrew chapter 4 and verses 12. He said, the word of God, if you don't know who you are. Every one of us need to examine ourselves. What is your life now? Are you righteous? Are you on your way to heaven and you so glad? Whole lot of folk in the church on their way to hell and it's too bad. Instead of allowing ourselves to be pushed back further and further and further in the marketplace from the debate, we need to step up like the Lord told us to and speak Stand and be firm for those things that are right. Look at your life. Every one of us have to examine because the devil wants to rock us to sleep. He wants to rock the church to sleep in mediocrity. He wants us, as I said Sunday, sit down on the seat of do nothing, lean back on the elbows of do less, go to sleep about what's going on around us and say, wake me up when the fight is over. The Lord wants us to be soldiers on the battlefield. No, not to go break out windows, turn over cars, and set buildings on fire. But stand unmovable for what is right. Speak when it's time to speak. Stand when it's time to stand. And do what God has commanded us to do. What is your life in retrospect? When you look back to where the Lord found you, what was your life? Who were you before you became a child of God? Who were you before your sins were washed away? Who were you before the Lord put all of your bad deeds in the sea of forgiveness and every bad deed was though you never did it, every bad word is though you never said it? Who were you before he touched you with the finger of his love and said, I forgive you like the prodigal's father did when he returned home and he came to himself. His father fell upon him. Put a ring on my boy's finger. Let folks know he belonged to somebody. Put a coat on his back. I want folks to understand that they don't look upon his nakedness. My son was lost, but now he's found. What's your life in retrospect? Every one of us every now and then to realize what God has done for us, we got to look at how far God has brought us. 
What is your life introspectively? Where are you today? If the Lord came back five seconds from now, where would you be spending eternity? Introspectively, where are you to, today? Every one of us from time to time, we got to take an introspective examination. Am I righteous, making the church righteous, therefore making the community and the nation righteous? Every now and then, we've got to take an introspective examination of ourselves. As someone said, do a checkup from the neck up and see how you're thinking. The Apostle Paul said in verses 2 of the, Rome, of the book of Romans chapter 12, the book that changed the world, Paul said, be not conformed. This is how you maintain your righteousness. This is how you be a child of God. This is how you change the country. Paul said, you don't conform. You make the unstoppable force meet the unmovable object. When others are saying, get along, get along to get along, Get along to go along. Don't rock the boat. Don't shake the tree. We say, I shall not be moved. Because I have looked introspectively, looking at myself uh, uh, retrospectively, and looking at where I am. I know the Lord's been good to me, and I am not going to move. What's your life in prospect? Where are you going? Five years from now, if you keep living like you're living, where will you be? Where will your children be? Where will your grandchildren be? Where will your nieces and nephews be? Where will your neighbor be? When we look at our life in retrospect and remember and find and determine where we are introspectively, we can see then where we're going. And every one of us need to ask ourselves, am I righteous? Am I one of those individuals who the Lord can look down upon like he did Job many years ago when the devil says, no, 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 I'm not impressed. You move your arms, stop bribing him, stop paying him to be righteous, and he'll cuss you to your face. God told the devil, it's not going to be easy as you think it is because he's a perfect and upright man. And even Job covered with sores, lost his children, all of his possessions. This man down and groveling in sickness and pain said, Though he slay me, yet will I adore him. Here's the man that gives us an example of how we are supposed to be. This is the reason why the Hebrew writer said to the brethren, when they're ready to quit, Ready to give up, he said, the word of God is quick and it's powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner. It will help you see straight. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The devil wants to get your thinking so scrambled up that you think, well, you know, everybody's doing it. It's got to be okay. It can't be wrong if everybody's doing it. Well, you know, they voted on it, and the majority vote, voted on it. But it can't be wrong if, if everybody voted. Well, you know, the Supreme Court approved it, and if the Supreme Court approved it, it it's got to be some merit to it. The devil wants to get you so scrambled up. God says, no, you need to go back to my word. So it can help you discern what is right and wrong. The word will help you evaluate your life inside and out so that you can know whether or not you are righteous in this unrighteous nation. Too many of us are more concerned about our reputation than we are about our character. What do people say about me? What do folks think about me? Do folks like me? Do folks love me? Do folks respect You know, God wants you to be concerned about your character. Your character is something that belongs to you. Folks can give you a reputation, and they can take it right back from you when they get tired of you having a good reputation. God said, as the prophet said in Jesse's house, when he went to find a king to replace Saul, who was more concerned about his political career than he was about serving the God and doing what God had commanded him to do. 
He said, well, God, you know, I made an executive decision. I know you said kill everything, man, woman, babe, babe, and suckling. I know you said don't bring none of this stuff back. But God, can you imagine how much political mileage we can get with old King Agag marching into the city in chains and all of these spoils? God said, let me tell you something, boy. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. So I can make a sheep with the blink of my eye. I can make a goat a camel with the blink of my eye. I formed man from the dust of his earth. I knew Agag before he was in his mama's womb. He said, obedience, obedience, Saul, is better than sacrifice. In other words, you're concerned about your rep instead of being concerned about your character. And that's why when he went to find somebody to replace Saul, he didn't look at all of Jesse's fine boys, all those fine, beautiful boys in Jesse's house. Oh, the prophet said, oh, I know that's the king. Didn't he say it? Oh, look at him. I know that's him. Man, wouldn't he look good in a Cadillac chariot going down the streets of Jerusalem? God said, I don't want him. Well, there's another one that's pretty as the other one. I don't want him either. Well, what about them that don't want none of those boys? And the old prophet got a little huffy with God like God didn't know what he was doing. The way we do when we think we're smarter than God. When we look at our politics in this nation, when we look at our academics, when we look at our medical field, and, and we look in all of these various directions, how many folks think they're smarter than God? God said to the old prophet, he says, I don't see as man sees. He says, man looks on the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. And I'm looking at the heart of every one of those boys, and I'm seeing another Saul. That's all I see. And once God got him in his place, like he has to get us in our place every now and then, he goes, well, do you have any more boys? He said, yeah, I got one more boy out there, David. He out there keeping the sheep and playing his guitar out there. And he went out there and ordained David because God looked at the heart of David. Was David perfect? By no means was he perfect. But his heart was right with God. God knows we make mistakes. He knows we falter. We get scared. He knows there are times when we don't know which way to go. But God knows us also well enough to know that if we receive with meekness the implanted or engrafted word of God, it will save our souls and it will strengthen us in those times that we lose ourselves. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 7, the devil wants you to concentrate on your failures, your faults, your fallacies, your, your frailties. He wants you to concentrate on everything but your faith. He wants you to talk about how many times you failed, how many times you've messed up, how many times you sinned. Paul said we walk by faith. Not by sight. We walk by faith, not by fact. Fact is, Paul could live in the past. Paul said, I walk away from all that stuff in my past, and I press toward the high calling. In essence, the apostle Paul said, if I stayed back there where, I'm, where Stephen is laying in a pool of blood, and I'm holding the cloaks of those who have murdered him, Paul is saying, I'll never get anything done. I've got to walk away from that. When God forgive you, you've got to forgive yourself. And the fact with a lot of us is we haven't forgiven ourselves. We still live in our life retrospectively instead of moving on where God wants us to be. And if we would stand together and stand up like God wants us to and walk by faith, there is nothing the devil, if you resist the devil, God didn't tell us to run from the devil. God told us to put the devil on the run. He said if you resist him, he will flee from you. Didn't he say it? If you stand, when all of this stuff that's going on in our nation, we don't acquiesce, compromise, capitulate, or give in to it. We stand. 
we have men like your preacher and elders, they stand in the pulpit and preach the truth. You go out in this community and live the truth. You raise your children in the nurturing admonition of the Lord. You be the beautiful Christians, senior citizens who've been in the church 30, 40, 50, 60 years and have not flinched or changed your belief. That makes the devil frightened. When you resist him, he will flee from you. Paul said to the brethren in Romans chapter 80, verses 24, Paul said, we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen, Paul said, is not hope for what a man seeth. Why does he hope for it? If we always waiting on something to happen, always getting ready to get ready, to get ready to get ready, to get ready to get ready to get ready to get ready to do something, the devil will push and kick the can down the road until you have your last day. You've got to be men and women of action who do what the Lord tells you to do right now. When the apostle Paul was writing to Titus, he had left Titus at Crete. He had left Timothy at Ephesus. Both of these boys had been trained by Paul and were to make sure the church was righteous, that the church was holy, that the church followed the will of God Paul told Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12. Paul said, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, you could substitute righteously in this present world. What are you saying, Paul? Paul said you've got to have a righteous church if you're going to have a righteous nation because everybody else has sold out. You the last man standing. Want me to say it again? You're the last man standing. Everybody else have already compromised, capitulated, given in, thrown up their hands. They've already accepted the changing of the woman's role. They've already accepted the homosexuals in various roles. They've already compromised the Bible instead of where the Bible says he putting she. You the last man standing. You're the last ones that preach the pure word of God without addition or subtraction. You're the last one that say all scripture are given by the by inspiration of God. You're the last one that say holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You're the last one preaching that Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth in America, if the church lifts up Jesus, if I be lifted up from the earth, I, I will draw all men unto me. Paul said to the brethren that we look not on things which are seen, but on things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, Paul says, are eternal. So I want you to think about these things tonight, my brothers and my sisters. Because the church has got to be righteous if we're going to be who God wants us to be. Are you righteous? The church must be filled with disciples. The Lord told us to go and teach all nations, Matthew 28 and 19. He didn't tell us to entertain them. He didn't tell us to have a mutual admiration society. He didn't say create a fraternity or sorority. He said make disciples. Teach folk what is right. Have learners, people who have learned what is right and therefore live what is right. Peter, knowing that he would be martyred soon, said in 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 and 15, Peter says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which called you is holy or righteous, so be ye holy 
in all matter of conversation, our conduct should be different from everybody else. In essence, the Apostle Paul is telling us as Christians that we've got to change. How do we do this? In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 16, Paul speaking to Timothy, who he had left at Ephesus. Paul said, take heed unto thyself, unto the doctrine, continue in them, continue. Don't compromise the doctrine. Don't change because folks don't want to sing with the spirit and understanding. Right now there's a movement in the Lord's church to bring mechanical instruments of music into the Lord's church. There's a movement in the Lord's church to do what God commanded us not to do as far as the role of our wonderful sisters. To do in the Lord's church those things which make us more palatable and attractive to a world that don't want this old Bronze Age book anymore. Paul said, continue in the doctrine. If you do this, Timothy, you'll save both yourself and those that hear you. I mentioned a moment ago, Titus 2, 11 and 12, what Titus said be so uh, that, that the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, responsibility to yourself, righteously, responsibility to my brethren, godly, responsibility to my creator in this present world. And every one of us have got to do this if we're going to go to heaven one of these days and hear the Lord say, well done, good, faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many. We've got to stand, church. We've got to stand. We've got to be righteous, church. Those in the kingdom, every one of you in this room, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be maligned, talked about. Tempted, pointed out, the Apostle Paul spoke about those who would do this. You're going to be tried, but you got to stand. The word of God is going to be outlawed. It's going to be perverted. It's going to be belittled and disrespected. But we still got to preach it, and we've got to stand. The church that bears the Lord's name is going to be isolated and ridiculed. You're going to be called all types of name. Our women are going to be insulted, saying that they are ignorant. Our men are going to be insulted, saying that they are narrow-minded. But we've got to stand. The government is going to make and enforce laws that violate every principle and teaching of the scriptures. But we, even when others compromise, we, the Lord's church, have got to stand. The media is going to betray you as a mindless, indistinct, biased, narrow-minded cult of people who have lost reality. But still, you got to stand. Denominationalism, atheism, socialism, and the various isms of this world and the exotic religions that have come from other lands are going to flourish in America. False doctrine is going to infiltrate our communities, corrupt the minds of men and women, but still we've got to stand the American idols of pleasure, prosperity, power, position, and prestige. Many people are going to bow down to the golden idol that's going to be around us. But still, as Christians, we've got to stand. When others say that we will bow, when others say we will kiss the ring of the powerful and the rich and the politically connected, and corporate America, and all the stuff that's piped into our families on the internet, Christians will still stand. One of these days we know that if we hear what is written in the word of God, we hear it, and we hear it, it touches us. When John was on the island of Patmos, they had tried to poison him, and he didn't die. The Lord said he was going to be the only one that would die of a natural death. 
John is put on the island of Patmos to die. And God gave to Jesus. Jesus gave to the angel. The angel took to John on the island of Patmos. And John sent the letter out to the seven churches of Roman Asia Minor. Several things about those churches that are indigenous and indig uh, 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 that are very clearly representative of what we see in the church today. Emphasis was told, you have left your first love. You have left your first love. In other words, the Lord said, you claim you hate this and you hate that. You hate sin. You hate false doctrine. The Lord said, you've left your first love. It's not about me anymore. It's about you. He said, you cannot hate what I hate and not love what I love. I sent you to save men. I sent you to save mankind, to change the world, not the world change you. I sent you to save the souls of men. I told you to preach the gospel to every creature. You've left your first love. It's not about me anymore. He told another. He says, you're neither hot nor cold. You're just going along. You're just going along to get along. You've made no stand. You haven't chosen sides. You really don't fight. You just kind of hide yourself away. He said, you make me sick. And I vomit you out of my mouth. He told another, you got a name that's alive, but you're dead. What the Lord is saying to us as he spoke to those seven churches in Roman Asia Minor, that a battle has been laid at our doorstep. It's our turn. It's our turn. We can talk about Paul putting his head on Nero's chopping block. As he walked there saying, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished my course. And they removed that good man's head from his body. We can talk about that all day. We can talk about Stephen going through the scheme of redemption, looking down the eyes of that murderous mob that took his life. And he died laying in a pool of blood, and the Lord gave him a standing ovation. We see Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. The Bible says Jesus stood. Stephen said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This young man stood and would not flinch. We can talk about the men and women that stared down the tigers and lions as they walked in the Colosseum. The men who felt that oil and tar on them with their hands tied as they're lifted up and knowing that any moment they're going to be on fire to burn till they die. We can talk about it all that we want to. But it's our turn now. It's our turn. When we go to Hebrew 11 and see that great cloud of witnesses, what do you think they're looking at? That great cloud of witnesses, according to the Hebrew writer, is looking at us. It's our turn. It's one thing to preach about it. And it's another thing to stand when you're supposed to and be what God wants us to be. When we hear that word and it changes us within, and we, something inside of us comes alive and strengthened, it don't matter if you're 9 or 90, that light will shine because folks can see the difference between you and the folks who's scared and afraid and unwilling to say what's right. Your voice might be softer than it used to be. You may walk slower than you used to walk. You may be on one of those little Cadillac pushers that you push down the church. It don't matter. It's what you say when folks look in your eye and they can see a conviction that says, I'm the Lord's. And until I leave this world, I'm the Lord's. And until I breathe my last breath, I will stand for what's in this book. And when you change your life by repentance and you acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord says, here's the deal. If you confess me before men, if when they're running my name down and talking about me and my church, and you say, hold it, hoss, wait a minute now, you don't talk about the Lord's church in front of me like that. You don't call the Lord's name in vain in front of me like that. You don't talk about the word of God like that in and, and, and Christian love. You make a stand for what is right. The Lord said, if you confess me before men, 
When you stand before my father, I say, that's my child. That's my child. When they were talking about my name, he stood up. She stood up, and she set them straight. That's my child. I will confess you before my father, which is in heaven. And it doesn't matter what you see in retrospect looking back. When you put it in that watery grave, and that word resurrection comes from a Greek term, which means stand up again, don't it, brother? It means you stand up again. You may have been down and groveling in the dirt and sin, but you stand up again, and you are born again. Born again. That's a good deal. That's a good deal. Born again. And if you fall away, the Lord says, I don't want to lose my children. I don't want to lose my children. That's why the Lord gave you that story of the prodigal in his parabolic teaching that says when you come to yourself like that boy did, I believe he had a handful of that maggot-filled garbage that the pigs were eating. I think he put his face down to eat it, and that ammonia knocked his head back. I remember one time, boy, a boy knocked me out. I was going to tackle him. I could just see myself tackling him. I was going to hit him at the waist, put my shoulder. I was going to put my hand, but you could do this back then. You put my hand behind his leg, I was going to pick him up, and I was going to drive him to the ground. When I woke up, I realized I didn't do it. <laughs> because the coach snapped one of those ammonia caps and woke me up. I believe that boy smelled that stuff and looked in his hands and said, what in the world am I doing? What am I doing? The Bible said he came to himself. If the devil can get you caught in a delusion Long enough, he will destroy you. We have to come to ourselves and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because you didn't sin, you sinned against him. David didn't say, I've sinned against Uriah. I have sinned against Bathsheba. He said, Lord, I've sinned against you. The prodigal didn't say, I've sinned against you, Father. I've sinned against my brother. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. Every sin, every sin is against God. And God takes it personal. And he wants us to repent. None of us need to be lost. We are two beautiful people. You've been, y'all been in the church forever. You've worked hard. You've given countless thousands of dollars and hours. The sisters were telling me about something, mats they were making out of plastic. Never heard of nothing like that in my life. How many countless hours have they spent just making those simple mats? Y'all have done the work. Don't do the work and lose your soul. Don't lose your soul. My daddy used to say, most of us are going to hell for chump change because we ain't got the guts to go out there and be real sinners. We just do the little tippy-toe sins. I, don't go to hell for tippy-toe sins. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I want to come home one day. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to love me because I know you do, and I'm going to love you right back. You can do it. We're going to meet on that cloud one day, aren't we, when the Lord comes back in glory. You think about it while we stand and say.